if I had sought out um, advisors earlier on in my career, I think that would have been a huge help. Advisors slash mentors, you know, whether it's paid or equity, whatever that, that looked like. I think that like, I looked at it as I'm making mistakes. I'm gonna learn from it really fast. And like, sure that happened, but like, you don't always need to take that approach. Welcome back to the Beyond the Wealth podcast. This is our third episode since we changed the name, originally the Virtual Ventures podcast. Today we have Daniel Snow, and Daniel has a background too long for me to put in the intro. You're going to find all about it throughout the episode, but I'll just preface it with he's an extremely accomplished entrepreneur. He's 30 years old. He's done just about every little niche that you can make money on online, and I'm really excited for you guys to get to meet him. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, for sure. Hey, podcast. So I, I've done my homework. You're and we're both in Miami. You're not Miami native, but I'm going to, I'll give you the branding of being Miami native. You've been here two years. That's longer than most. Most people fizzle out. Or Actually, don't it's three years today. Oh, today, but today's my three year anniversary. Dude, what yeah, a the very first. There it is. The, that's a beautiful way where we're, we're bringing in the three year anniversary with a podcast. So I've done my homework. The audience doesn't know much about you. We're going to dive in. And I usually like to do the interviews in chronological order, go through where you started your journey, but give people just a little bit of an overview about who Daniel is before we dive in. Yeah, I have, uh, have been a serial entrepreneur. Um, I was the type of person that like ever since a young age, like I was the type of person that always knew, well, after I realized I couldn't play in the NBA anymore, um, always knew that like I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I just had had that in me. So um, I didn't have necessarily the support in my early years to to. Although I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur, I'm like, what, where do I start? What do I do? You know, at a, at a very young age, so wasn't able to like set that as a goal. Which is just kind of like, you know, like family settings and whatnot. So. I went to school to be a dentist and um, yeah, I was in the accelerated path of dentistry. Definitely was not excited to do that. And um, you know, I was like, oh, you can work for yourself. I can dentists make great money. I can take that money and be able, be able to then, you know, create businesses, you know, on top of the dentist. That was like my thought, my processing going into it, which is not the best thought process, I think for anyone trying to, to work in the medical field. But uh, yeah, I, I um, stumbled across the fact that you can make money online, specifically on your phone, on social media. My sophomore year of college, this was 2012. And um, my life changed ever since then. You know, that the day I found out, I was in the gym, um, left the gym, made a Twitter account. My friend was telling me you can make $45 a week. I was like, well, that's crazy. And um, yeah, it was just literally from that day, from that instant, my life changed and many people around me. And yeah, from, from then, from there, just started learning how to grow an audience on social media, which led me launching multiple business to monetize that audience and effectively other people's audiences as well to figure that out, which led me getting, launching my own brands and agencies and media companies and apps, um, taking that money, reinvesting it in my own real estate portfolio and other investments. So, uh, yeah, I've done quite a bit in the online space and, uh, have seen many different things, had a lot of successes and failures, and yeah. Dude, this is one of the the best parts about interviewing, when there's an endless amount of things we can talk about. But I wanna start, like you said, where you had that oh shit moment, and most people are like $45 a day. What, what, what does that mean? $45 doesn't do much for somebody. But I remember, and I'm sure you can sympathize, when you make that first dollar online, when you realize somebody on the other side of the phone that you don't know just paid you money for something. Isn't that a crazy feeling? Like, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely, it was crazy making the first dollar, but really being able to make, make for me at the time, which was like, I'm getting, I'm not getting this to change my life, but change my career at the time. It was really just so I could have money to spend on the weekends at bars and, you know, which eventually changed that goal to, have enough money so I don't have to work a summer job to, to you know, to other things. So it was like, really, once I saw, well, so like, I didn't have to get a job. I was making a little bit more than what I would have made on the beach, on the golf course, this, that. I'm like, life is amazing, yeah. you know? 
um, and doing that consistently every day, I like, was like, this is, you know, this is an amazing um, idea. But yeah, I had many aha moments throughout my online entrepreneurial career. And um, I would say each time it's, you know, the bar had, was different just based on seeing something that could be a reality. And that was, I think, like a big kind of pattern I've noticed just at least about myself. Like once I can visualize that, like I can do this, like I, I've, I've been able to turn that into reality. And it's just been different. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it crazy when you can just blow through those like kind of ceilings that you set for yourself? Like, oh, I made my first dollar. Well, $500 online would be insane. And you make 500 bucks. Like, well, a thousand would be crazy. And it's just endless. And I think like, as people watch and go through your story is a great example of that. You've, we started with $45, but by the end of this conversation, we're far from that $45 amount to what you've been able to accomplish. You start building this brand on Twitter. It's in the fitness space. You're trying to monetize it, make money. What challenges did you have to face during that period? Cause I know it wasn't just one day I start tweeting and I have 10,000 followers yeah. the next day. Yeah, the well, the biggest the, the biggest challenge I faced was six months and countless hours into building this audience. I had twenty five thousand followers after six months, which like might not sound like a lot for today, but back in two thousand twelve, like twenty five thousand followers was actually somewhat of a big deal. Like we had, you know, it had actually like there just there just wasn't a ton of people doing it, so. Um, and for me, you know, that 25,000 could have been millions. At least it felt like that way. So I had just put, cause this was from zero, having no idea what I was doing, just doing all these creative marketing things to try and gain every follower I could following, unfollowing, getting the community to, you know, doing these giveaways, scrappy giveaways. And, uh, after six months, the account got suspended slash banned on Twitter because I don't even remember anymore. I think it was just like following too many people or mess. I, it, it like wasn't anything that made sense. Um, anyways, yeah, after six months, I, it just got banned. And I, re I literally remember I was, I, where I was, what I was doing, the feeling. It was just the worst fucking feeling in the world. But, you know, I, I maybe had one day of pity, maybe less than that. But right from then, I'm just like, I know how to do this. I knew I can do it faster. I can do it better. I can set my goals larger. And that's exactly what I did day one. So, um, I mean, that was a huge obstacle for me to overcome starting again from zero is just the worst feeling. But, um, I think take it, you know, I was able to reframe that and just say, I know I can do this again. I know I now have a better idea. I know I can spend money to grow. I can, you know, I know how to monetize it earlier on. So yeah. Um, that was kind of like one big one. So you're in college now this business is no longer an opportunity. You've been banned. You're going to school for medical, you're in medical school, or that's the route that your parents want you to take. How much of a hurdle was it getting them to understand, hey, I'm making money online. I don't know if I want to go this career route. And then after the fact, how hard was it to say, hey, I'm, I'm not going to follow through with this. I'm going to go this way. Yeah. So, well, I, I still kept pursuing what I was doing, growing audiences on Twitter. But really when I, when I got banned, it shifted from just fitness. Like I want to grow these fitness mm -hmm. brands. Cause like that was my passion at the time to now I just want to grow a large audience. I don't care what it's in. And once I, once I changed my mindset, which probably wouldn't have happened if that didn't happen, mm -hmm. that was when I was just able to rapidly grow the audience. So I kept doing that. I kept pursuing that. Um, yeah, I took my, my DATs and, um, the, the, well, number one, I, I, I failed my DAT so that, you know, wasn't able to go to dental school. No, I didn't fail them. I, I didn't get the, the grade you need to get to necessarily get into dental school. Yeah. Um, at least on all three, there was like science, perceptual ability and something else. And, uh, on the science, I didn't score well enough just because that summer I was going to this, I was going to the library every day and it was one of the most miserable summers of my life. <laughs> Uh, I remember just going to Dunkin' Donuts to every every morning. It was miserable, but um, I was going to the to library every morning while a business I had launched a, a, a self serve ad platform, performance based platform for essentially influencers and theme page owners to monetize their account was blowing up. 
So I was making thousands of dollars a day at this point while I'm doing something that is making me miserable and depressed. And I'm just like, midway through that summer, I was just like, there's no point. Like I've made as much money as a dentist halfway through the summer, he would make in a whole year without going to dental school. But I've already, I'm already here, I'm already there. Like I, I might as well just take the test. But like, I hadn't made that decision that I'm not gonna be a dentist. Um, still took the test, but um, yeah, after that it was kind of easy, you know, like not going to dental school, mom and dad. Um, but no, yeah, there was, there was, I, I didn't need their approval. It would've been nice to have it, Yeah. but I already had made that decision for myself. Uh, which was hard, you know, as a 21 year old kid. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but the thing is like, you know, the business was doing so well that like, and I, at this point had such a big chip on my shoulder. Cause like no one was really, I felt like no one was really on my side that, uh, I kind of, I definitely used that to fuel my fire. And, um, yeah, I mean, by the time I graduated college, you know, I'd bought a condo on the Hudson river. I had bought a Maserati. I had these, so it's like, oh, you know, my parents, you know, Things could be worse. Yeah. You're a 22 year old son to be doing that stuff. Um, so I, you know, I kind of just let the, let my, uh, you know, actions speak speak louder than what I'm gonna do in that sense. How did you launch this SaaS platform? I don't even think the word SaaS was a thing back then. You you built this platform. Did you do it with a? Did you have a partner? Yeah. Did you outsource a lot of it? Did you were you developer savvy? Like. For people listening, that's not a small feat to launch a product like that, let alone have it blow up. And we're talking about you're 30 now. That was you in college. That was early yeah. for a platform like that. Totally. Very, very early. Um, no, I definitely would not have been able to do that by myself. No, no chance. Um, I had a partner. He had the technical ability. I had the marketing ability. And we kind of came together and... And, you know, we obviously had much different skill sets. I was able to get people on the platform. I was able to, 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 you know, allow them to understand how to do these marketing campaigns, how to leverage their audience. I built the media buying team, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and yeah, that's how we were able to make it work. After I graduated, he actually became my roommate, which, uh, we both thought was such a great idea after watching, you know, like the, the social network movies and that sort of thing. Um, but one of the one of the worst decisions I've made, you know, for anyone listening, do not live with your business partner. Um, I guess if you're if you're not married, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it was uh, it was a terrible decision, and everyone I know who has made a decision, I warn them, and usually it ends up them them finding out for themselves. But uh, yeah, what was it like working with a partner, and obviously? moving in wasn't the best idea, but was the relationship always great? Why didn't you continue on with that platform? Because if we look back now, we'd think, oh, that was a gold mine. You could have run that up all the way through right now. Totally. Um, and that was the idea. There was just, you know, don't want to get into all the details, but we just had a lot of, I think, living with each other. We grew so much kind of animosity and resentment towards each other that for sure impacted our willingness to want to work together. And it just became very toxic. And it was just at the point where I'm just like, I just don't want to work with this guy anymore. He probably felt similar. And, um, unfortunately that, that was what happened. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, like we're still, we still, we still message each other here and there checking in. Like, you know, if, if that didn't happen, like who knows where I would have, where I would have been today. I'm incredibly grateful to have worked with him. Uh, the cafe, the platform was called caffeine digital. And, um, I had learned so much from that business. I had learned really a lot of the, the core skill sets that allowed me to be a successful entrepreneur throughout my career from that, which is like learning the importance of networking, learning, you know, how to be in the right rooms with the right people, how to conduct yourself, how to, you know, communicate with others, understanding how to build a team, um, understanding how to manage that team. It's just like all these things I was learning on the go and in a pretty big business within a year. So, um, yeah, unfortunately it just didn't work out, but, uh, that allowed that, that I, I, the skill sets I gained from that, I applied to my future businesses and that was what allowed them to grow really fast as well. That's, that's great. And, and whenever I interview people and talk about, talk to entrepreneurs, 
it's never just one thing. They've had multiple. And when you take that bird's eye view, every success failure is a stepping stone to the next one. And whatever happened in that business set you up to be extremely successful in all the other ventures you've created. What was that transition period like? You're no longer going to be dedicated to this project. You're now looking for the third thing that you're going to dive into and build. How are you feeling as an entrepreneur in that like kind of in-between period? Yeah, that in-between period, I think anytime you're in that feeling in life, or at least me, um, is the worst feeling in the world. I think uh, it's just a, you know uncertainty, not knowing what I'm building towards. I mean, you know, in fact, I'm in that position right now again. But uh, I think at that point, I would, that was like, someone else asked me a question, this question once. And I think that that was actually probably the lowest point in my entrepreneurial career was when our business relationship was like on the fritz and I knew I didn't want to go back in it and I didn't know what I would be doing next just because I had gone from just college kid to, you know, millionaire, so to speak really fast mm -hmm. so all the, i had that chip on my shoulder i had the last laugh on my friends and family were kind of like doubting and laughing at what i was doing to now like proving them wrong to now it's like shit like was that the peak you know um because when you're 22 it's like how like how can i do this again how can i replicate the success like i just it's hard to visualize that so it was a definitely a scary time period but um I was lucky enough to have, you know, once again, having someone in my network, he had an office, he was in a similar space. And I was just going to that office every day, just like trying to think, you know, what I'm doing, trying to work on things, trying to work towards something and um, just kept that consistency. And naturally an opportunity came um, for one of my friends from college. We partnered up on a, on a, on a, on a phone case brand and that blew up and that turned into, you know, $25 million a year business for the next few years. And one thing led to, an, you know, sold that business. And yeah, it was just really just putting myself in that kind of mindset that I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm going to be successful. I'm going to keep working while that uncertainty was going on. But yeah, it was definitely a very like scary feeling, especially because I wasn't like, I didn't know what I was working towards yet at that time. Most of the people that listen to this are younger entrepreneurs, people who want to start a business or haven't started a business. So I always try and ask questions that I think maybe they're thinking are as beneficial. Everything that we're talking about here, you're 18 to 22. Where was your social life, your high school friends, your college friends? Like, did you have time for them? And if you didn't, how much did that impact you? Yeah. Yeah, there were definitely strange times. Um, I had a girlfriend throughout college, so that I felt like me allow didn't I feel like that was what kind of gave anchored me to not have to go party all the time. I didn't I, I truly didn't have much of a social life in college. I was in a fraternity still, but uh, I didn't go to a ton of the parties. I didn't go to the mixers. I didn't you know get wasted very often. And, and like, I was just working my, my ass off. I definitely had FOMO in those years though. I definitely did. And after college, you know, when I became single again, I definitely had a, you know, let a lot of that out, but, uh, I had already kind of like created a large base for myself. Um, but through those college years when I had nothing, I was, yeah, I was, I was hustling my ass off every single day, but that was what I wanted to do. And it felt really good. Um, especially when everything was like the first time, you know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I just, I really wasn't too, too focused on, on the social component, um, in college when I was just getting started. And now looking back, you're, you're 30, would you do it all over again the same way or would you go back and change a few things? Um, I wouldn't. I, I, it's not like I would change any so where I'm at today. I wouldn't change anything, but sure. I could do things differently. I think that if I had sought out, um, advisors earlier on in my career, I think that would have been a huge help. 
um, advisors slash mentors, you know, whether it's paid or equity, whatever that, that looked like, I think that like, I looked at it as I'm making mistakes. I'm going to learn from it really fast. And like, sure that happened, but like, you don't always need to take that approach. And I think during that time too, I think my ego prevented me from like asking, um, asking questions and not making it seem like I know everything, which like, you know, for it's when you're a young kid, you don't, you know, but, uh, I, I think, so. yeah, exactly. I, 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 I just would have, I would have actively sought out, um, people in the industry um, and asked for help earlier on. And I think that would have changed the way I was operating business in, you know, in many different senses in that time, especially if I would have worked with like a coach or anything like that. Yeah. And I always, I, I like, I'm big on mentorship, but still struggle to want to double down, invest, pay more. And I know when I had my businesses, the reason why I was successful was because I was paying for mentorships. I was learning things. What is your view on mentorship now? Do you think paid mentorship is is good? Do you think you should just suit find like natural mentors that you come across throughout your journey? Most people are are kind of on the fence on both. Like, no, you don't need to pay people for like advice. But most people I meet, a lot of their success comes from like, hey, I invested because I don't want to say pay. I invested in this person and I got so much back. And I know a lot of people listening are like sometimes against paid mentorship. What are your thoughts on that? I don't know. I would love to know why they're against paid mentorship, but paid mentorship is great just because of the, it, it gives, you know, incentives, so to speak, are aligned. And then it gives the person on the other side accountability to try and give the most value he can. Uh, paid mentorship just gives, gives the mentor in that, in that aspect the accountability to want to provide the most value possible um, and not gatekeep anything because they're getting paid to do that. So I think if, if, if you don't have that approach and you're not well, yeah, it's kind of like a strange perspective to have on it. But no, pay, paying mentors, you know, it's, it's just amazing that like one piece of advice can have so much leverage over, you know, an impact um, on someone. So it's just, yeah, if you learn one, one thing on a $500 call, like, that can be worth, you know, a lot, a lot more than it should be worth a lot more than $500, um, whatever that is. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and I always just like to ask it because you don't have to convince me. I'm all for paid mentorship. I have paid mentorships that I'm going to attribute thousands of dollars to that didn't cost me thousands of dollars. But I always think that people just view it like, and I don't know if it's because this whole movement of high ticket, high ticket, where like, almost anybody's selling their time for $3,000, which I think is a little bit of a turnoff to others. But I like that you highlight some, some people you pay 250 bucks, 500 bucks, and it's just one thing you need to learn that yeah. you can go rinse and repeat and make $5,000, $50,000 with. Totally. So we've gone through, you found out you can make some money online, made a Twitter, had that business, built this SaaS platform around helping creators monetize their audiences. Now you're in this, we, you, you, you get out of this rut, we'll call it. What was next? So what was next was that, that the phone case brand I mentioned. Okay. So e-com. We e -com. E -com. Yes. So e-com. Um, well, actually between that was apps. I was also doing apps at that time while I was running the platform. Um, learned how to, I essentially learned how to get any app uh, trending on Twitter at the time, which had big impact because the interface was a lot different, which then in turn got it trending on the app store, mm -hmm. which once again, the app store was different back then. So that drove a lot of traffic. Um, and I had hundred percent success rate doing this. So I was working with different app companies, um, to get their apps trending, just, you know, as you call it an agency, I wasn't ages, was, you know, I was doing it as a, I guess, marketing service. And then eventually I had, uh, app developers just approached me to come in as a partner and I was a marketing component. So I did that. I had a lot of success with apps and, um, after the platform died down, got into, into e-com just because, you know, I was like, I can build a brand that has equity. It's a sustainable business. If I do it the right way, I have full control over, over what I'm doing. And I know how to, how to send large amounts of traffic 
Um, I had all the relationships with all the influencers, theme page owners, et cetera. I'd really dialed in pricing in terms of what I need to be profitable. Every, all them, all those metrics were, 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 uh, were dialed in. So that was when I kind of had the product in mind and the partner, um, our brand was just had explosive growth day one. And, um, yeah. What year is this? This is 2016. You're so early on all of these trends. I feel like, like you, things that blew up in 2018, 2021, you were doing them three, four, five years early. How, like what gave you the ability to kind of find these in the moment niche markets that are now mainstream? Um, yeah, I was just in it, you know, um, having the platform, I had kind of so much visibility, the platform, my job as the owner of the platform was to literally find out offers that can make people money with their audience. That was literally my, effectively my job. Right. Um, so I had just gotten so much visibility to what works, what doesn't work, how to have success. And, um, and yeah, you know, naturally e-com was just the, the, the kind of next stepping stone. Also, I had grown into a community and a lot of my friends were now in the industry. We're constantly talking, who's doing what, who's having success, who's not, what's interesting. And um, yeah, through that, through my network, through just experience, you know, la launched, uh, launched brands. Um, the phone case business wasn't actually the first one. There was two jewelry brands prior actually. And they were reasonably successful, but like they were, they didn't have that explosive growth that uh, the phone case business had. Um, so yeah, just really try, trial and error, constantly looking at the market, constantly thinking about what else I could be doing and, um, and just having kind of like self-honesty as to like, what, what do I want to do? What do I want to build towards? Um, so yeah. What was your favorite, what was your favorite e-com brand? What was the one that was the biggest win and what was the one that was the biggest fail? My favorite e-com brand as a... Like the one that you built, owner? like the one, regardless um, of the success, maybe one that you wanted to be I would successful. say Goat Case was probably the, uh, the favorite just because it's really interesting. Like it was, what, it was 2016. So it was kind of when, you know, Gen Z was starting to really get into Twitter and Instagram and like, first finding out about these meme pages and whatnot. So I feel like we just had, not feel like, we had such an insane marketing campaign. Like we were buying over 50 million impressions a day. And our reach and impact over Gen Z and kind of like what a successful brand on social looks like, like really impacted them. And, you know, I, I see random videos still to this day on TikTok, people making videos like, do you remember this phone case brand? Here's how they made money behind it. And I'm like, this is crazy, you know, like That's people are amazing. just like using this as a case study still. So it's a cool feeling. And like, that was the, one of the first ones where it was like, we were like, just like understanding consumer psychology and building marketing campaigns from that. We were also super early on influencer marketing and just leveraging UGC and as paid ads, like obviously it became just commonplace to do that. But 2016, it really wasn't. And we just like absolutely dominated that space doing that. So, um, fits the theme of you being really early on yeah. this trend. Yeah. So, um, I would say that was the most fun and yeah, you know, all my friends started working for me. My brother was working with me on that. My friend from college had all my friends started packaging orders. We had a warehouse. I was like just doing everything for the first time. It's like, damn, we're like building a real business growing from warehouse to warehouse to warehouse. So it was just like shit was crazy. And it was like, every day was chaos. But like, I woke up every morning, like fucking pumped to get to work. And I, I still remember that feeling. So it was my favorite for that reason. Um, the most successful brand we had was a shapewear brand called Perfect Sculpt. Um, that business was insane. So a lot of the mistakes we had made early on with Goat Case, we no longer had those. So it was just like, dude, because, of the, because we, we had learned so much from our first brand, um, with our second brand, Perfect Sculpt, which was also kind of a product we took, made viral and trending and whatnot. And um, yeah, that, 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 that brand just was incredibly successful also out of the gate because of that. 
So our first year, we did 25 million in revenue. Ooh, first year, yeah. which is just like insane. Like, you know, naturally when you do that, a lot of things broke for fulfilling orders, which was even, even crazier. Uh, working with shapewear um, while scaling that fast can also be problematic, as you can imagine. But uh, yeah, it was wildly profitable too in that first year, which is like doing being that profitable and having that much revenue year one is just like insane. Um, and it was fun. It was really fun doing it. Um, just constantly getting creative, thinking about new products we can, we, we can bring. Um, yeah. And then what was, what was the next question? Uh, which was the biggest failure? The biggest failure was a, was a, was a company called auto brush and we were really excited for it. It was a toothbrush. that was like a mouth guard that brushed your teeth. And we're like, you know, with all these other products and like video cells, we had so many marketing ideas for it. We had beautiful branding. We designed, we had just like a lot of things. We're like, we're going to crush this product. Um, and we had tested the product before. We placed like a $200,000 order, $300,000 order. And we found out that, that so many of these devices just didn't work. Oh. Like the manufacturer just fucked us over completely. And yeah, we had a, we took a huge loss realizing now, I don't know why we didn't file an insurance claim. <laughs> um, but, uh, cause we did have it. We did have a product insurance. We had, had business insurance back then. I wonder if it would have covered it, but, um, yeah, that was just the worst feeling in the world. Also, it was a feeling of like, like embarrassment for the, like the, cause the team saw that, right. Cause yeah. we're building the brand, building the landing page, this, that. And like the team knew the excitement they were building towards that too. And to see that like we brought this product to market and a lot of these devices just weren't working was just like, as in the owner, just like was really kind of embarrassing and brought a lot of humility. Um, Cause like, you know, they want to work, work for a great company and build great products as well. And um, yeah, that was, that was really disappointing. That was a big failure. Um, yeah. What did it feel like we'll go with the, the shapewear brand? I mean, 25 million in your first year is insane. What did it feel like sitting in front of the computer when it started to just hockey stick? Oh yeah, it's just a video game. <laughs> you know, I I loved video games growing up, and that's why I was like, this shit's just a video game. Like I want, it's fun. Like I like seeing just all this shit on my screen. Um, that was why I wanted the warehouse too, because like it's not just on the screen, it's real. Yeah. Then I realized I don't want the real problems that go with it. <laughs> I don't want to, you know, I've seen other people, other people out there on Twitter who've also thought it was a genius idea to manage their own warehouse and fulfillment. And, you know, everyone can, can just imagine the, the stories of, uh, of, of having, you know, dozens of employees inside a warehouse. It's just insane stuff, insane stuff. We had love affairs with some of the packers and pre just weird, crazy stuff was going on. And, and, and just like, it was the best day in the world getting rid of that. But, uh, yeah, it was just like, a, it was, it was, it was, you know, just like an adrenaline rush every day. And I was like, how can we do it? more, 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 more? Um, it was, you know, it's the best feeling in the world, seeing something that you, you create, um, bring it to real life and just see it blow up. There's no better, there's no better feeling like it. Um, so yeah. So you're most popularly known for rap TV where did that fit into the equation here that was after the e-com brands and that success or before during during so you're building the e-com brands you're still involved in social media and building exactly. theme pages yeah so actually so because i told the story initially I, I started my career growing audiences on social i still had those audiences while i was growing the e-com brands okay but i was like you know focus i'm like i need to focus on my on on growing brands these theme pages are just a waste of time i don't want them in my brain i even though i had people managing i'm just like i want to be fully focused so i sold all of them except for rap at the time this was 2017 and um sorry why 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 because i'm like rap can be a real brand it's not just a theme page you know it can be a brand a real brand that has brand equity and there's so many things we can do. Um, and I seek ways to monetize and build an audience and build a community. 
And it also, you know, it was also something I loved. So like I kept it, I was never full time when I was just a little side project. Um, I had a team running, but, um, yeah, rap was just in the background throughout this time. Obviously I was, I was putting time into it, working with the team and giving them strategy, but it was never the focus. And, um, that brand was able to just, you know, be what it is today, which is like pretty crazy. You know, we have the biggest, for those that don't know, yeah, we have the biggest, essentially rap TV has the biggest audience for what I'd say rap fans on the internet. Um, and now it has also media brands and gaming and fashion and pop music and reggaeton. Um, so it just turned into something pretty substantial and well-known on the internet. But uh, yeah, it was pretty crazy just like how I was never the one full-time running it. Um, and once again, it's like, damn, like I should have earlier on put a real team in like a bigger team in place because it could have been something bigger, faster, or more robust. But uh, it's at a great, great place today. Um, still not the one running it. You know, we have a great CEO running it. But uh, yeah. It's it's cool for me because I'm a huge rap fan. Yeah. I was that kid in sixth, seventh, eighth grade listening to Lil Wayne. Love that. Listening to all that music. Where did your passion for rap come from? I don't I I don't I don't know where it came from. I just always had it. Um well when I was growing up, I was just like everyone listened to rap music. Yeah, you know? And wore the clothes, you know, this, that. Oh, yeah. Um yeah, I remember in like seventh grade sneaking into the movie Get Rich or Die Try It. I was the coolest fucking kid in the world. And uh, yeah, that was, I just loved it. You know, I played sports, played basketball and soccer and always listened to, to rap music. Parents always hated it and told me to turn it off. And um, it just, you know, there's kind of like a feeling behind it. Kind of like feeling like that chip on your shoulder. I'm going to, you know, like, you know, all that, all that. That kind of like emotion behind it, I think that's what I resonated with a lot, especially with my favorite favorite artists, and um, that like grinding mentality, you know. And um, yeah, so I was I was, I was just a rap, huge huge fan of rap since as young as I can remember. And and for me, it's so cool because I've been seeing rap TV's content for my whole life that's because cool. my algorithm was rap based. I always followed all the rappers. I was always into sneakers. I was always into Love fashion. That. And people don't give rap enough credit for the impact it's oh, had yeah. on fashion, on jewelry, on just culture. Just cult, yeah, rap moves cult, like culture oh, yeah. today, like really. And it's just crazy to me because it's funny as a kid, like I can look back as a kid and see a page like Rap TV and think like, damn, I wonder like what the business behind that is, like what it, what it looks like. It's just somebody uploading pictures and now to be sitting here talking to you in my later life is pretty surreal to me. And it's interesting how things come full circle. And like, I get the way the businesses work now, but it's so impressive how you've been able to not only just have all of these different ventures, but still keep rap TV at the core and make it what it is today. And I know you were the CEO just up until recently. What was it like building that company out from the start to finish? Because I think that's what a lot of people are going to click in and want to hear about. What was it like building Rap TV from what it was in its early days, just an Instagram handle and a passion for rap yeah. to the biggest rap social media outlet? Yeah. So we brought in a CEO recently, but I, I did I did bring in kind of like another person on the team who was kind of like running running it a few years ago. Um, just because, you know, I, I mean, I had the agency, I had the brands, I had a lot on my plate. I couldn't, couldn't be a CEO, a real CEO of multiple things at once. So definitely had a ton of help. And I, and I, you know, was never date. I wasn't day to day CEO, um, until kind of, you know, a shorter period of time. But, um, the, how did I do it was, uh, yeah, I think number, number one, the biggest thing is consistency. You know, we had a team on it and just every day, day in, day out, we set a goal we need to, you know, to post this amount of time. We need to cover every single thing possible. We need to, to, to understand what's going on. It's just really understanding what we, where we want to go and how, and, and what we need to get that done. So, you know, it was like, we know we need to grow. This is how we're going to do it. We know we need to build a community. This is how we're going to do it, which is like working with the rappers and labels and all that. 
to get them involved. We know we need an engaged fan base. That's how we're going to do it. We know we, we, we want not just to build a, a page, but a brand. That means we can't sacrifice our, um, our audience for just short-term money. So, you know, there's all these things in mind of this is what I want to build long-term. And that just allowed us to be, uh, you know, day to day honest with, with kind of like our approach and what we were doing and be, and be lean doing it just because I, you know, I didn't, I didn't, because I was managing other stuff, I, I didn't have the ability to build these huge teams. So everyone involved was passionate. You know, they had to have that passion to work on what they were doing. And because the team was so passionate about what they were doing, they were able to just bust their ass because, you know, it was an extension of, 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 of their passion. Um, so it didn't feel like work. And I think just putting together a team now, a bigger team like that has been what has allowed the brand to be successful and just constantly be the forefront of like innovating as a, you know, as a social first media brand. So, yeah. It's clear that you've been a master delegator through all this because you've touched on it and like, there's just no way you could run all of these companies throughout this time solo. What, what advice could you give to an entrepreneur who's struggling with delegating, bringing on other people? Because it's tough when you think you need to run the show yourself. Yeah. What advice could you give somebody? Um, I think the biggest thing for newer entrepreneurs, at least for myself, early on is trust. And I think trust and limited mindset is what what doesn't allow people to take that next step. For me, early on, it was just like, I knew I want to build a team because I don't want to, I just don't want to do everything. Like I never yeah. wanted to do everything. So like the second I started making enough money to be able to hire someone, I did day one, even when I was 19, 20, whatever. Um, a lot of people don't have that same mindset which is fine because there's a lot of problems with managing people too. So I guess first is just knowing what you, what you want and where you want to go. Um, but if you do want to grow and build a team and delegate, the biggest thing is trust. You know, if you're not hire, if you don't fully trust someone, then you're, you know, you're just hiring an assistant, you know, an assistant really. Yep. And you're not going to build trust with them because they, because they know that you don't trust them. So I think bringing in people that, 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 you know, you have respect for and can trust to do their job will just allow you to not get in their way. There's a difference between coaching and micromanaging. And I think that's a lot, what a lot of people don't understand. Coaching is, is necessary, but micromanaging throughout that pro after that kind of, you know, period of time where you're getting that, the, building the context, um, is a different story, story entirely. So if the trust isn't, if, if you don't trust who you're bringing on, like it's just not going to be successful. Um, and um, the second thing is, uh, I don't even remember the question. What was the question again? The advice to somebody who's having sh trouble delegating, okay. bringing on people. Yeah. The second thing is with trouble delegating is, I would say, you know, fear is another big thing. I think that people get scared because they're not making it the same amount of money right away. And that's just kind of like that limited fear mindset. Um, the only way, you know, you're, you're only as good as, 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 you know, your, your time is. And if you can have extensions of that, that's how you grow. So I think if you can get the people can get beyond that fear mindset and hire talented people, you know, that it should, you know, it, it goes a long way. Um, from my experience as well, mistakes I've made is trying to take the cheap route instead of the right route especially in terms of hiring, not just employees, but everything, you know, lawyers, accountants, advisors, everything. Um, going the cheap route always blows up in my face. So hiring people and hiring them the right, the right people, even if they are more expensive, goes a very long way. So if you now hired the right people and you trust them, you know, it's not, it's not too hard to, de it's really not too hard to delegate. Um, in fact, you want to delegate because now you trust that the right person is going to do a great job and that allows you to focus on, on other, uh, on other facets of the business. So I've definitely done that really throughout my career. Um, took me a while to get to the point where I was comfortable doing it. Took me a while to build my managerial skill sets where, you know, there's clear transparency and expectations on here's what I expect of you. Here's what success looks like, looks like, you know, per quarter, per year, et cetera. Um, 
here are incentives if you do you know, all, all, those, all those natural things that go along with being a good manager and having good structure in place. But um, it all starts with just having the right people in the right sheet in, 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 in the right places, in the right seats and having trust in them. So just for people just starting out, hiring off, off the bat, um, that's absolutely crucial. Um, going into that mindset. Yeah. Awesome. Before we go into the agency part, which it feels like we're just going next business, next business. I have to bring it up. You got to go to dinner with Drake, private dinner, <laughs> shut down Carbone. What was that experience like? Cool guy. Did you get to interact with him? Yeah. I don't know where you pulled that one from. I don't remember. Um, shout out a, to stick talk. Stick talk. Andre. I got a stick talk. Um, yeah, that was super cool. It was just like a very surreal moment. I think that was the first time in my life where like I had a, they, I don't know if it was visible, but like I had a little starstruck kind of, you know, thing going on. Cause it's like, it's a weird thing, especially with Drake. Cause he's so relatable. It's like, damn, I feel like I know this guy, yeah. you know, it's like, a, it was like a weird thing. Um, we've kind of grown up with him yeah. like as like the guy. Exactly. The time. And he's like very relatable. Yeah. He's not this like mysterious guy. So it was like, it was a weird feeling, but, uh, the funny thing was, he knew of my shapewear brand because all the Instagram girls he liked was wearing the bras. Yeah. He didn't know about rap TV at that point. The reason you were there. Yeah. That's crazy. Which is just like a weird, it's very strange. Um, Shows how Drake's up here. The team that manages all the stuff is all around. Well, you know, rap, rap wasn't as big of a, that yeah. was like when we were first getting going, but it was still, you know, it was still, it was still definitely something. Uh, but it was just strange that he knew that the shapewear <laughs> brand and not that, but no, he was like, Super personable, super nice, very friendly. Um, I didn't know about carb even what Carbone even was at the time, so I didn't know you know. Be after you know that you know you know they even had the line you know going to Carbone, someone on the grocery phone that line. It was yeah, it was cool. It was it was, it was a really cool experience, um, just hanging out with him. Um, so yeah. And for people that don't know, Carbone, there's one in Vegas, one in New York, one here in Miami. You got to wait like two months to go sit down at the one in Miami. You got to go to the shutdown main location, which is just yeah. insane. Well, that was when none of, none of those other carbones existed yet. This is the, wait, this this is, is the one. This is probably 2017. From what was it, 18 maybe. It was a while ago. That's crazy. Yeah. So the agency, I feel like, is almost just organic because you've been doing all this for yourself, for your brands. Now you want to go and offer those services to other brands. What was it like building this agency? I know you worked with your brother on that, which is really cool. I have a younger brother. My dream is that one day he'll want to get into some business and entrepreneurship and we'll get to do something together. But what was that experience like? Yeah, it was, uh, well, my brother had actually been working with me since 2015. On the e-com stuff? Even on Caffeine Digital, the platform. Oh, okay. okay. He wasn't a partner at that point. He, cause he was actually a dentist in the air force at that point, but, um, he started working for me, you could say on the platform and he was just amazing day one. And, uh, you know, we launched Go Case. He became a partner. We launched, you know, other brands became a partner. When I launched the agency, finally, you know, he quit dentistry and became 50, 50 full partner. And yeah, it was awesome. You know, we have very different skill sets and, um, definitely could not have done it without him. Obviously, once again, the trust thing, right? Trust mm -hmm. in a partner is, yep. is a big thing. Obviously, your brother, you trust him. Um, you know, naturally, anytime you have a partner, you know, not every, it's not always perfect. But yeah, we've had a ton of success together. He's been there since day one. He's worked his ass off. And um, it's been, yeah, it's, it's, it's great. It's great making money. But more importantly, it's great to do that with people that you like, you enjoy, and even better do it with family. So, uh yeah. And you had a successful exit with that agency, I know. Yeah. And just for people listening, what did that agency, what services did it provide? So the agency provided media or course services were media buying for consumer brands. We also did retention marketing. Um, we also had a creative studio that did organic social management, video and photo production, web design. Um, and as part of the media buying services and core packages, that was just not like just pushing buttons, as I like to say. We were doing full, you know, full funnel. You know, we were designing the funnels, thinking of the marketing, 
doing the, 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 the market research, um, thinking of, you know, doing the actual, getting the actual raw content, doing all the, uh, iteration with, you know, in the actual, um, photos and videos that we were, we were, uh, in, in the creatives for the ads. So yeah, we were just really doing everything A to Z that a brand would need, except for SEO was really the only thing we never did, but, um, yeah. Was that the first company that you had sold? No, we had sold all of our brands before the agency. So everything was exit. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. What was the agency was the most recent one. Was that the biggest acquisition? We don't have to talk any dollars and cents, but was that the biggest acquisition yeah. or biggest sale? Yeah. What was that like? Cause that's kind of we're we're now at the now part of your story. You've stepped down as CEO. You're no longer involved in that agency. What was it like kind of letting go of that almost last thing that you had built from the ground up other than your baby, Rap TV? Yeah, it was a... Uh, it was a strange feeling. Um, it was an awesome feeling, especially because the agency was only around, I think, three years at that point, three and a half years, which... Maybe if it's right for people listening, does or doesn't sound like a long time, but that felt like a fucking millennium because that we launched at before COVID, during COVID, after COVID, multiple cities. I moved to Miami, you know, I was in a relationship, got out of a relationship. It's just like my life had changed drastically so many times throughout that time period. Um, and, um, yeah, the team was huge. We had a hundred employees at one point. So wow. it was just, I learned so much, you know, about just like growing a real business, a real organization, I like to say, um, and managing fucking hard, <laughs> hard managing that many people. Um, but yeah, it was just a great feeling taking it to completion and, and seeing, you know, a lot of people on our team who also had a, you know, aligned incentives and seeing them get a piece of it too. It was just a great feeling. Um, yeah. So we're, we're, we're now in the present state. What are you doing with your time? When are you spending your time? I know we, we go all the way back to that transition from don't have that business anymore. Feel like you're in a little bit of a rut. Clearly things are, are it was good at the time. You were living in a nice condo, had a Maserati. Now you're in a really nice condo in Miami, which isn't too bad of a place to be. What are you doing now? Um, so I'm not working right now. Uh, well, we, I, I have a, I'm not working full time, I should say. So I launched a gut health brand a few years ago. So still spending time, some time there trying to get that all off the ground. Um, has been one that hasn't been as successful as some of the others for sure. So needing, you know, needing some, some TLC, so to speak. Um, other than that, yeah, I had a real estate portfolio that I've sold eight properties in the last 12 months. I'm winding all that down. Just creating space in my life to be able to kind of take advantage of something if it presents itself. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, day to day, I'm you know, meeting with a lot of people, um, trying to put my you know, health first at this point which has been a little up and down when I'm traveling, but yeah, working out a lot. Um, and I've been traveling a ton. Um, so yeah, as you know, that in the last six months, I've been to Japan, to Bali, to England, to Switzerland, to Italy, uh, going to Israel on Monday. Then I'm going to Argentina, Antarctica. Jeez. There's just, yeah, a lot of travel. That's amazing. Yeah. And I know you went on a solo trip for two months. Yeah. What was, I've like never been away or solo in anything in my life. I've always had people Costa around Rica me. Also. Costa Rica is amazing. Yeah. I love Costa Rica. What, what was it like being solo for two months like that? I mean, you live here solo, but to me, it seems like such a foreign concept. It, it's definitely was scary at first. Um, especially because I started in Japan and not many people speak English in Japan. Yeah. So it was like, even the waiters, you know, like trying to talk to people. Eventually I just kind of gave up. Um, so it was very lonely, 
but um it's great you know i think like if you can if you can if you can be comfortable being with yourself for long periods of time it's just such an advantage in life uh, and um you know the old kanye line you know if you love yourself you'll never be alone it is very true you see that when you're traveling alone it just gets you out of your comfort zone too you know approaching people also, what I love about solo traveling is that you just don't need to have any compromises for anything. Yep. Anything, right? If I want to just do nothing one day, I can do that. If I want to walk 30 miles and just do tons of shit and be on my feet all day, I can do that. If I want to go, you know, expensive restaurant, cheap restaurant, this, that, skydive. I don't know. Like, I, it, whatever I want to do is on my own, on my terms. And when you're traveling internationally where you're some places you might not get to see again, like, to me, that goes a long way. So like selfishly, there's that component, but yeah, being able to meet new people, have new experiences is awesome. Um, that being said, if you're always able to share it with someone, I think it does make experience better, a little better at sometimes, but yeah, you know, for those people who are like, want to go somewhere, you know, you don't have anyone to go with doing going alone is a, is a great thing to do. And at least for this trip, I was intentional about it. I was like, I want to go alone. Like I don't want anyone coming with me. To get specifically so I can try to grow, get out of my comfort zone, stuff like that. Yeah, it's crazy. We're so used to like our phones and like always having people around. I just recently started just going on a walk, 30 minutes a day. It's great. When I'm in between meetings, no phone, just me walking mindlessly, thinking about whatever comes to mind. And at first I was like, this is kind of hard. And then I was like, I can't believe this is hard. Like that's a problem right there. And now I don't think I could go a day without going on that walk. The amount of ideas, the clarity that you get. And I mean, you, you did it on steroids there with the full solo travel trip. But it is crazy how we've gotten so caught up in these phones and being attached to things. It feels amazing. So refreshing to detach. Like totally. That. So you have the gut health brand that you're working on. Are you just right now kind of just like a... <laughs> It's a horrible analogy, but I always say what comes to my mind, kind of like a spider web, just waiting for something to come through and you're going to dive in on that. Um, I've kind of gave myself a year. So September wouldn't be that year. And, um, um, well, technically it would be August 1st, but I'm, you know, you're marking kind of September. And, uh, I wouldn't say waiting for something to come. I mean, it's like, if something comes, that's fine. I think I should be intentional about what I want to do. I don't think I should just go to something that's interesting and opportunistic just because I want the next thing I do and do it in a big way. I want it to be, to be purpose driven. Okay. Something that align, aligns with my values and, and, and something that, you know, I'm passionate about, uh, not just something to make any money. Yeah. So, or just build a team or whatever, you know, uh, cause at my point where I'm at now in life, that just like, doesn't, it's no longer interesting. So, naturally you know we, we all want to make money we want to be successful that's part of it but like you know having having it be purpose driven i think is, is 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 of utmost importance yeah and i think that's great and that i it's kind of similar but people ask me like oh i want to start a podcast like what should i do and i'm like well it needs to be about something you're you care about because by episode 10 or 15 if it's not something you're passionate about or you don't have a purpose for continuing to make the content I'll put my money on it that you're going to give up. So something like that in, in a position that you're in, I mean, money isn't the issue anymore. You don't need money. You're not looking for something to level up. I mean, you're, you're at an amazing place. It's now something that you can really be passionate about growing. And I would be shocked if this next venture isn't your biggest one. <laughs> Appreciate that. I sure hope so. Yeah. And it's, it, and it's just cool for me. Cause I sit down with, with people like yourself and everybody's either in your shoes where they've been successful and now they're looking for what's next or they're in that inflection point of very successful, but want to go to the next level. And I, I think it's so cool for me because now I, I always tell my guests, like I'm invested in you now personally, because I know you. So now I will be looking to see you be successful to see what you do with your next kind of opportunity. And uh, I'm confident you're going to have a book. Well Thank you. Yeah. Dude, this has been an absolutely amazing conversation. I, I think that your ability to one, be out in front of the traditional trends, but also at a young age, know 
delegation and be able to create these teams and scale. Most people can't run one company. You're running multiple at a, at a, at a moment. We didn't even dive into your real estate portfolio and all that because you've just been so successful across the map. So thank you for, for being willing to come on the show and have this conversation. I think people watching are going to get so much value. I love that. Yeah, I hope so. Um, and yeah, you know, anytime I always love like after sometimes I get these random messages on Instagram like, oh, like, your thing impacted me. So yeah, if anyone, anyone watching has, you know, anything to share, always feel free to, to reach out on Instagram, you know, at Dapper if anyone's watching. Yeah. Um, how, how people like the show, I always love to hear about it. So yeah, yeah the help one person always, you know, goes a long way. Dude, I say that all the time. I'm like, if one person watches my interview and it helps them start a business, gets them motivated to do something or gets them through a tough time, it's a win for me. Totally. I don't need the 100,000 views. It would be nice. <laughs> Not saying that I don't want it, but I'm always looking to just help one person every episode. And thank you for shouting out your at because I always make a comment. People are too lazy. It's always linked in the description, but sometimes people are too lazy to even hit the damn description button. Um, so... If you are interested, reach out to him, connect with him. I think there's just a wealth of knowledge and clearly he was nice enough to let me come to his place and interview him. I'm sure he'll be nice enough to answer your DMs. So dude, thank you so much yeah. again. It's been an absolute pleasure. And we'll watch this clip here at the end again and know when you have that big win, we'll have you back Love on that. the show and go <laughs> through it. I think that's, that, that's a deal. Perfect. That's a deal. All right, brother. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, man. Jesus. How was that? That was great. Feedback. That was good. So we had a really good question. Did an hour. Nice.